We are in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 2. And while I'm not quite ready, I don't have my Bible open to the right spot. Hebrews chapter 2. So our message is the title. I'll announce it here, and I'm going to announce it again a little bit later. The glory of the incarnation. So last week we had the devastation, or two weeks ago, we had the devastation of the fall. And so today, the glory of the incarnation. Now I'm going to start this message a slightly different than I, uh, differently than I used to do or I'm used to doing, uh, I am going to mention uh, some uh, cultural figures. All right, so what is it that causes men, and some women, I suppose, to become fans of sports stars or various public performers? And think about the fandom. There's, there's followings of all kinds of people. So I'm going to give you some pictures here just to illustrate. So here we have a football quarterback. This is actually Steve Young of the San Francisco 49ers. Not that I, 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 I don't really care about American football. And I, even care, I don't even care anymore about Canadian football. They've gone too woke for me. I'm done with them. But, but here's a man. Here's a man who can throw a ball farther you know, than anyone in this room. And he, he can, you will watch his plays. And he will do spectacular things on the field. Here's another fellow. Somebody might recognize this guy. All right. Now, I do follow him a bit. <laughs> if I was at a game watching uh, Connor McDavid play and he did one of his very spectacular goals, you would, you would see him rushing up the ice. His trademark thing. He goes flying down the ice and deeks around all the guys and does a spectacular play at the end. And everybody's on their feet. It's shouting and giving honor to, some people call him the McDeity. That's quite offensive, actually. Okay. Here's another. This is a different realm. Okay, so you might not know who that fellow is on the, on the screen, right? But you might get an idea with the Lord of the Rings. Now, that fellow is, his name is Andy Serkis. And he is, uh, he is the voice actor for the character of Gollum in the movie, of the Lord of the Rings. Now, I am right now listening to a new version of the audiobook for this, uh, for this book, and Andy Serkis is the reader. He is a brilliant voice actor. You listen to this audio, you would swear that there were multiple voices playing the parts. He has a different voice for all of them, and they are so different, you would not, that's not the same guy. It's just really exceptional. And people will look at men like this and they will follow them. They'll read everything they can about them. They will give to them glory and honor. All right. Now, why is that? Why is it that these people are, are held up in, in our estimation? Well, they're highly skilled at what they do, and they're doing it in public display. Their abilities manifest glory in a certain sense. All right? not, not in the sense like the Lord. We're not talking about that. The rest of us can only wish to have half as much skill as them. Uh, I, <laughs> when I was playing hockey, they would give us the worst possible life to, uh, ice time to try to get us to quit. <laughs> I mean, it was, you know, and, uh, and they finally, we had, we had two teams in this slot. We played each other every week. Fights would break out. Our championship game, there were two teams made the playoffs. It was amazing. Our championship game, they canceled the game because there was so much fighting. And that was very disgusting to me. I thought we were going to win for sure. But anyway, so we could only wish for the kind of skill and, and even in a local level, if you, have, if you have in the high school, you have those boys who are really the top athletes. They sort of strut around like they're somebody, right? Because they have a certain amount of glory, and they gain a following. All right. The thing that attracts followers for public figures is the glory on display, as they are in a small measure fulfilling the creation mandate. They are 
they are dominating in a field. God created us to rule, to have dominion. For the athlete, he has perfect control over his body. You can go to any sport. You look at those guys that are at the top and the things they can do and how they just, they, every time, they can sink that putt or score the goal or whatever it is they do. They're just incredible athletes. Or you might see those who are skilled in acting or singing or speaking for the public performer. And, and it's just such a, it's so really incredibly better than the rest of us that just we really are um, amazed by it. Now, suppose you were to point away from such people, uh, from hero worship of such people, and we're told that you must find the most degraded person in our society, the one of the least reputation, and to take him as your hero, as your dominator, as your king. Now, what would you think of that? Would that make sense to you? The readers of the Hebrews, of the book of Hebrews, were wavering in their commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. They were under pressure, perhaps. They had the pressure of state persecution or even just persecution from people in their community who were antagonistic towards Christendom. They were, they were find certain aspects of the story of the Lord perhaps somewhat challenging and somewhat uh, embarrassing. Maybe the, those who were pushing against them were throwing in the face the, 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 the actual uh, detestable image of the cross. I mean, it's something that we are very familiar with. In our culture, it's been exalted for so long that the cross seems a place of honor. It was a place of dishonor in the first century. It was not a place of glory. And so whatever the pressures that were on them, they were actually wondering whether it might not be a good idea to pull back from identification with Christ, perhaps to slip into Judaism. That's the impression that we have as we read the book of Hebrews. Perhaps to slip back into Judaism with the idea that Judaism is an approved religion. And, and uh, we, we can escape persecution there and we can still worship the true God. That's basically the idea. We've talked about that quite a bit as we've talked about this book. Now today, we're going to turn to the passage that we were in two weeks ago, but now we'll see, we'll see instead of the devastation of the fall, the glory of the incarnation. So Hebrews 2, 5 through 9. For he did not subject to angels the world to come concerning which we are speaking. But one has testified somewhere saying, What is man that you remember him? Or the son of man that you are concerned about him? You have made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor. You have appointed him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in subjecting all things to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. But now we do not yet see all things subjected to him. But we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. And so we are now, last time we were basically talking about verses 5 through 8, and we will talk about them somewhat today, but we're going to bring in now verse 9. We see him, we see Jesus. All right, our proposition for the message today is this. The remarkable thing about Jesus is that he is the king full of glory whom we should follow, though his first coming ended in seeming failure. The remarkable thing about Jesus is that he is the king full of glory whom we should follow, though his first coming ended in seeming failure. So we're going to do a little review. We need, need to, of course, the failure of man, verses 5 through 8. That's the part that we were talking about last time. We see there this quotation from Psalm uh, 8. And we're, I'm not going to spend uh, the whole message on this, but we do need to recover where we were and what we were talking about. The, uh, David in Psalm 8 was meditating on the creation mandate. Genesis 1, 26 through 28, where God created man 
in his own image. He said to the man, have dominion over the fish of the sea and over all the things that, uh, the animals on the earth and every, all, all things, have dominion over all things. I'm roughly butchering an attempt to quote that passage. As you can see, God created man to have dominion over all things. God created man to rule. God created man to, to, uh, to have authority. God created man to use this world. Not to abuse it, of course, but to use it and to make, be productive with it and, and uh, create uh, a civilization with it. And Dela David in his psalm celebrates that dominion, dominion with a song of praise. And in his song, there is a note of incredulity. He listen, he, he, he's singing, what is man that you remember him? He, he thinks, man is so weak. Man is so subject to failure. Man is so uh, uh, subject to sin. But what is man in his weakness that you have made him to have dominion over all things? David is seeing dominion as a privilege given to man, granted to man. He's living, he is singing his song, he's composing these thoughts after the fall. He is thinking of man as a sinner and man as a mortal. But man nevertheless privileged with dominion. He, God created man in this way. Now, the, man, the men and women that you and I see, the men and women that David saw, were full of all the same kinds of weaknesses. When God created man in the garden, when God gave to man dominion, the weaknesses were not present as yet. The fall had not occurred. The subjection to death had not begun. The, uh, the tendency to selfishness and to sinfulness had not even been thought of. And so the man of the garden to whom the uh, dominion was given was a far better man than the man David observed and that we observe and that David sang about. And we talked about last time how, how there is even uh, in our world, there, even in us, there is that impulse towards dominion. Uh, now we can't all be kings uh, or queens. We can't all be the one in charge, obviously, but we do have responsibilities, things that we take care of, that we uh, hold dominion over. Many people seem to abandon their responsibilities, and uh, they, uh, uh, they l allow their world to descend into chaos, and they do very little to organize their world. But even in some way, I think almost every man tries to control some area of his life. It's just the way we are made. All right, that's what God did. And the overall sense of Psalm 8 is wonder and gratitude. As David sings about this, this characteristic of men. What is man that you remember him? Or the son of man that you are concerned about him? You have made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor. You have appointed him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. That Those are words of wonder. He, he's amazed. He's grateful for the things that God is doing and has done for man. Now there's a certain ambiguity in our text. And we highlighted this a little bit last week. But I'm going to uh, look at it uh, a little more closely today. David spoke about mankind. What is man that you remember him? All right, verse 5. Now, our author in Hebrews is speaking about Jesus. If you go through verse 5, well, I guess that's verse, uh, verse 6 where he says, what is man? Verse 5, verse 6, verse 7, verse 8. You might be wondering, who is the author of Hebrews referring to? If our passage were to end in uh, verse 8, Eight, you might think, I'm not sure who he's talking about. Is he talking about mankind in general? Or is he talking about a specific man, a certain man? All right. Now, uh, when we come to verse 9, we'll just look briefly there, and then we'll come back there in a second. But we come to verse 9, but we, de we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels. Namely, Jesus. So we say, aha, he's talking about Jesus. 
Where is he? Let's look at those verses again. Let's think about what he's saying. Now, uh, a couple things to note in verse 5, and I think I said some of this last week. I was writing this, mo or last week, I keep saying last week, the last time I was here. Uh, for, so we see the word for in verse 5, for this text uh, is a further reason connected to chapter 2 and verse 1. I remember highlighting this. What We're trying to figure out where, uh, where that word for was pointing. All right, so Verse 1 said, For this reason we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away from it. Chapter 1 is contrasting the revelation given through the prophets and the revelation given through the Son. And then he proves that the Son's revelation is much more important because he exalts in very strong measures the deity of the Son. Puts him very high. That's what chapter 1 is about. So, verse 1 of chapter 2, For this reason we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard. And then he gives a reason uh, in verse 2, and then another reason in verse 4. 4, excuse me, verse 5. Verse 2 begins, For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable, how will we escape? In verse 3, If we ne neglect so great a salvation, the word being spoken by the Son. And now, verse 5, For he did not subject to angels the world to come, the implication here is that there is something given now to the Lord Jesus. All right? The Father did not subject the world to come to angels. What is the world to come? Well, the word for world here is the word from which we derive the English word economy. The uh, habitable world is what it meant in Greek. It is, it is the, and he says it's the world to come. The habitation to come. In other words, he's talking about the new dispensation. The one that follows this one. And if you know your Bible history, you know your theology a little bit, you will know that we are still in the same dispensation as the writer of Hebrews. We still live in the same world. There is still this world to come. It says here, for he did not subject to angels the world to come. So the world to come is subject to someone else. Uh, in chapter 1 and verse 6, we saw that Jesus was exalted to this world. Right? He is set over this world. And it is this coming dispensation, this coming economy, that we are speaking about here in the passage. Notice he says, about which, or concerning which, we are speaking in verse 5. But Jesus isn't named, as I pointed out, in verse 5. He's not named until we arrive in verse 9. So in the psalm, David meant mankind in general. You go to Psalm 8, and you read what he's saying, and he is clearly thinking about man in general. What is man that you think of him, that you give him this place? We see that in the quotation there. And our author is leaving it ambiguous as well. He still has no mention of Jesus through all these verses. And as I said, if he had stopped at verse 8, where would we be in our understanding? Well, here's where we would be. We would be trapped in human failure. Who does rule in the world to come? In the world of the kingdom, who is going to rule? Man was given dominion over all things, and yet... We do not see, verse 8, we do not yet see all things subjected to him. We look at the world in which we, you and I live, and we find that our world is, is, is not subject to, subject to any one man. And none of us will look at our world and think that we have all things under control. We do what we can with what we have. We try to order our lives. We try to fulfill the mandate as much as we can. We try to be uh, our Lord's servants in doing all these things. But even we fail. And this gives rise to all sorts of problems in human history. It, it includes the striving, the fighting, the wars the family breakdown, and even personal psychological problems. Perfectionism, for example. You know, the person who, has a perf who is a perfectionist has to order his world. And he has, to get, he has to be in control. And it can be kind of funny to watch. They made a whole television show 
about a fellow who was very perfectionist, or maybe he had OCD. I don't know what his problem was. And the way to drive him mad was to move one little thing that he had ordered out of place. And that would be just more than he could handle. And he'd have to, he'd have to stop everything and go line it back up. All right? And so, uh, so our, the, the tendency we have towards dominion can lead even to psychological problems. Now, I would say that most of us have given up on the instinct for dominion, at least over any major portion of the world or even of our life. My wife would say, I've given up on that in my office, certainly. <laughs> and, you know, I was looking. I, the thing is, I should not go into bookstores. All right? And I, I was talking to somebody before I left on this trip, and I thought, oh. And I, he mentioned some books. Okay, so I ordered them. Well, they arrived while I was gone. I'm sure my wife was really happy about that. And then, while I was gone, I have to confess, I bought three more books. <laughs> I said this morning, I was thinking this morning, hmm, okay, these are my books for this year. <laughs> I have to get, I have to read them. I'll stack them up. I have, uh, I have a stack of books that I've acquired over the years and intending to read them someday. But this year, I'm going to read these ones I've got the last two weeks. I've got four, I've got eight books the last two weeks. I will read them. That's a commitment. Anyway. All right, but we have given up. All right, we've given up over trying for our goals for world domination are over, most of us. But as I say, almost all of us have some area of life where we seek to achieve perfect control. And we may succeed enough to make us content. But at this point where we are, we do not yet see... Where, we, where the passage says, we do not yet see all things subjected to him. This is the place where we are. And here in this place, this is the present dispensation. In this dispensation, man attempts to rule. Okay, man attempts to rule. Yet in this dispensation, men fail. And so the words, the world to come in verse 5, and the words not yet in verse 8 imply, well, let me, they, they reveal two things. They reveal our failure. That's what we focused on so far. But they assume future success. Human dominion of the world to come is God's plan. So how will we see such success? Well, here is how it begins. It begins with the humiliation of Jesus. And this is where we're going to really get into the new material for this week, the humiliation of Jesus Christ. But we do see him. And notice the contrast here. Maybe we should give a running start here and read the last phrase of verse 8. But now we do not yet see all things subjected to him, but we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus. What do we see now? We see this world where no one rules, but we do see him who was made a little while lower than the angels. And what we see, first of all, is his temporary humiliation. What does a little lower mean? Notice how it says that. A little while lower than the angels. The terms in verse 9 uh, are very close to the terms in verse 7. I should have put this on the screen, but I don't think I did looking ahead at what my screen says. So verse 7, literally, I'm going to just give you a, this is, now that, it's not an expert translation, it's my translation, so it, there may be a better, but I'm trying to give a literal, word-for-word -word translation with what I'm going to say to you now. So in verse 7, it says, you have made him, he's talking about man in general, David is, you have made him for a little while lower than the angels. That is what our, uh, our text is, uh, our translators have given us, all right? But, the, but the, here's my literal, uh, very wooden translation of the Greek. You made him lower, lesser than the angels, or lesser, lesser from the angels. You made him lower, lesser from the angels. Now, the thing I want you to notice is that there is, that the words little while are not in the text. 
Okay, now our translators have given them to us, but they're not in the text. It's an interpretation. Now verse 9, here's the translation. It's slightly different. But the one lesser from the angels, having been made lower, we are seeing. The one lesser from the angels, having been made lower, we are seeing. Now what we have here is... First, and uh, Daryl made a joke about my grammar lesson. So you're going to get one again, Daryl. <laughs> All right. So in verse 7, we have an active verb. You made him lower. Okay, he's talking about man. Okay. Now, what changes in uh, verse 9 is we have a pass a perfect passive participle is the technical name but it's translated this way having been made lower okay, that's it's looking at him in his status having been made lower now the fact that it is something that has been done to him in verse 9 implies that it is a temporary condition and that's why the words, our translators, put a little while in verse 9. All right? We do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels. Because it was having been made lower, is something done to him who was so high, we see this as something temporary. So a little while just wanting you to follow the logic. You may say, what is the point of this? There is a point, so hang on. All right, so having been made lower, made a little while lower, his, lo his uh, humiliation is temporary. That's the implication. Now, we are talking about Jesus in the book of Hebrews. We're talking about his superiority. He is one who is exalted to the very high position. That's the message of chapter 1. Jesus is the one to whom the world to come will be subject, as it mentions in verse 5. Jesus is the one who we see now, though for a little while, made lower than the angels. His lowering is temporary. Now, in the psalm, in verse 7, I'm not certain they should have added the phrase, uh, uh, the word while made him a little lower than the angels. He's talking about mankind in general. We are made lower than the angels. He was made for a little while lower than the angels. That's the distinction I'm trying to get to. Not sure how well I explained that, but I tried. All right, so the way we contemplate him, namely Jesus, the way we think about him is in his incarnation. When was he made a little lower than the angels? When was that? When he became a man. He humbled himself. He became a man. I want you to compare here uh, Philippians chapter 2 where Paul is laying this out for us. Philippians chapter 2 and verse, well I'm going to start with verse 5, but verse 6 through 8 is really what the thing is talking about. Have this attitude in yourselves which was also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, that's very high, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped or held on to, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. So Jesus existed in the form of God. He emptied himself of his glory and became a man. So simply by becoming a man, the Son of God experienced a great humiliation. He went from being very high to be very high, I gestured, gestured down, very high to very low. He became a man. So in, in status, he even subjected himself to becoming a little lower than the angels. To become a man is to be lower than the angels. He is the creator. He's becoming a little lower than the angels. It's a remarkable statement. Not only that, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to, po to the point of death. 
He humbled himself even so far as to experience death. He is the deathless one. You know, in some churches, they have announcements to tell you to turn your phones to silent mode. I've never done that, but maybe we should. Now, it happens, and it's, bad. it's worse when it's the preacher. All right? Anyhow, um, Jesus, Jesus humbled himself even to, to, uh, so far as to experience death, but it goes even further, even death on a cross. Even death on a cross. And as I mentioned, the cross was a symbol of degradation. It was the worst possible death you could die in the Roman Empire. It was not a place of glory. And Tom Constable gives us this comment. Some of the original Jewish writers of Hebrews felt inclined to abandon the Christian faith because of Jesus' humanity and even more, his death. Because perhaps he wasn't the Messiah we're looking for. That's the temptation. Now the objection isn't stated in the text, but the implication of Hebrews is that the heater, he, readers were drawing back from their profession. And the teaching of our passage points out that Christ's place a little lower than the angels was temporary. His humiliation is contrasted with man's failure. Verse 8, as I pointed out, we read this. Now we do not yet see all things subjected to him. So man has failed to rule. Man has failed to follow the mandate that God gave him. But we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus. And then, uh, and, and he is set in contrast with uh, the failure of man. But you would say, now wait a minute, here's Jesus, he is, he is a man, and he died, and where is the glory? So the glory of the Son is what we come to next. Oh, I was going to show you these verses, and I forgot. So where are we? The glory of the Son, Jesus Christ. And I want you to notice in particular this phrase in verse 9. Because of the suffering of death, that's humiliation, crowned with glory and honor. So the very, the very thing that made him a little lower than the angels for a little while lower than the angels. In fact, taking him to the very lowest of mankind, to the death of the cross, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor. The very thing that that men would look at him and say, he should be despised, is the thing that brings about his coronation. His coronation. Jesus is crowned with glory and honor. Now if you have your Bibles there, turn back to chapter 1. We're going to see his glory in chapter 1. Notice in verse 3. Uh, let's see, when he had made, it's near the end of the verse, when he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. That's glorification. Okay, because of the suffering of death, he's crowned with glory and honor. Having become, it says, verse 4, much better than the angels. He was for a little while lower than the angels. He's become much better than the angels now. To him the Father says, in verse 5, you are my son. To him the Father says, in verse 6, let all the angels of God worship him. To him the Father says, in verse 8, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. To him the Father said, in verse 10, and then the following, you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth. And to him the Father said, sit at my right hand. His glory was brought about by his humiliation because of the suffering of death. The very thing that seems to be his weakest point is the cause of his greatest glory. God crowned mankind with glory and honor of a kind. David says that in verse 
uh, 7. You have made him for a little while lower than the angels, but have crowned him with glory and honor. God has given mankind the preeminent position in our world. All right. God did this by decree, but he, he crowned Jesus with glory and honor. Not simply by decree, but because of his work. His deepest humili humiliation became the ground of his glory. And the glory of Jesus is for a purpose. Look at the rest of our verse. So that... By the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Jesus participated in the most degrading effect of the fall, death. And one of my commentators says, tasting death is an idiom meaning to experience death fully. It's not like he's taking a taste test to see how good or bad it is. It is an emphatic expression for dying. And this death was on behalf of all, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For everyone. So his death stands in for the death of every person ever born or ever will be born. Now that may seem like an extreme statement, but hang on with me. He took part in death to become the penalty that Adam brought into the world. After Adam, all die. Jesus submitted to death. He, he submitted to death to taste death for everyone. His purpose was to remove the penalty of death for everyone. And I put in my notes in brackets, in potential. In potential. We know that it is only in potential since the Bible clearly shows that many will not receive any benefit from his death. The Bible says, call on him and he will save you. But if you do not call, you are not saved. The Bible says there will be many who will be cast into the lake of fire. If you have not received him, you will be one of those. He tasted death for you. He took the penalty on himself for you. That's why he's crowned with glory and honor, so that you could be saved. His death was by the grace of God, not something anyone earned. And all our failure and all of the things that we try to control in our world, of our own world and of our own making, all of the things that we try to do, we are not, we are not the king of our castle. So by the grace of God, we have a king. And his name is Jesus of Nazareth. So rather than being a concern as these readers are tempted to not follow Jesus, maybe we should go back on him. That is the last thing they should do. The, the, his death should be no embarrassment. It is the reason most of all that we must follow. We must follow Jesus Christ. And so to consider the proposition once again. The remarkable thing about Jesus is that he is the king full of glory whom we should follow Though his first coming ended in seeming failure, the world never saw the res resurrected Christ. The last thing they saw of Jesus was him being taken down dead from the cross. But they should look at him and hear the words of the apostles, he's alive. His humiliation is the ground of his glorification, his incarnation made possible. This glorification. And the glorification guarantees his dominion. He is to rule the world to come. And he has conquered death. For every man has he conquered it for you. That's the question. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our Father we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that you would help us as we really turn our hearts to him. 
Lord, I pray if there's somebody here who does not know him as personal Savior, that today would be the day that they would change in their hearts and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, whether it's a young person or an old person, Lord, help them to understand. Jesus is their hope. We pray that you would work. pray that you'd work in all of us. Help us to carry this message around our community and around the world. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.